Well, hello everyone. I'm back. This is Mel here. If you haven't met me before, I am Mel of Sneakers Corner. I have been doing videos about the origins of Islam for the last few years. And recently I've opened up a new channel called Origins and it's on two platforms. It's on YouTube and it's also on Rumble. And I've also backed up all the old videos on Odyssey. So if you want to check that out later, please do so. Now this is part two. Um, in part one we looked at the beginnings of AJ Juice's paper which relates to the Dome of the Rock, in, in particular the, the inscriptions and the dedications in the Dome of the Rock and also the mosaics and asking the question when were they created. Now the standard Islamic narrative which we're going to debunk today is that these were created way back in the 7th century and just about everyone believes that. I did, um, pretty much anyone among the sin sifters would have accepted that, but AJ Juice has come out with a paper that basically questions the veracity of the claim that these inscriptions actually came from that early. Now there obviously are a few anomalies because um, uh, in terms of the particular style of writing that's found in the descriptions, these the diacriticals, it is a bit suspect that they seem to have come from that early and we don't have many other examples. That should probably raise a few red flags, but generally most scholars had, had uh, good confidence in these um, inscriptions and in the fact that the mosaics apparently came from the 7th century. Now I, I want to point out as well that I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm asking questions based on, on evidence and I'm not just looking for whatever is asserted to be confirmed by evidence. I'm not here to come up with some crazy conspiracy. I'm just asking questions about evidence. Okay, so just want to put that out of the way. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Asking tricky questions doesn't mean I'm necessarily buying into some conspiracy. Um, obviously, if a story that we've received, a tradition that we've received is legendary. Obviously there's questions about how did that legend start and perhaps one option might be a conspiracy but that's not the only option so please don't assume that just because I am questioning the history, the received history or even the tradition that that means I necessarily buy into a conspiracy per se. Okay so let's get started. As you can see um, there's an image there of the Dome of the Rock at the top and a little hatch door. Um, what colour would you say that is? I would su suggest it is gold. Um, but it wasn't always gold. Um, and like a, a lot of things in the Dome of the Rock, a lot of things have changed over the centuries. And let's just dive straight back into it. So we're going to be looking mainly at AJ Juice's paper. It's called The Jewish Serpent King in the Dome of the Rock, Primary Evidence Big Daddy of Inscriptions, a Colossal Fraud. And obviously if you haven't seen part one, stop it here, go back to part one, have a look at that first, so that you know where we're going. I'll leave the, the link just above us here now. So where precisely are the inscriptions today? So the inscriptions inside the Dome of the Rock are mainly mounted to the outer and inner faces of the octagonal arcade, which are depicted in the picture. Uh, right in front of you. You can see the red arrows. Um, now you have the inner octagonal arcade and the outer uh, octagonal arcade. So the inner octagonal arcade there are inscriptions that are basically facing inwards. You have other inscriptions on the other side essentially which are facing outwards. Okay. So we'll come back to that later. Where in the Dome of the Rock is an inscription that says who built it? Which we have assumed to be Abdul al Malik. Uh, we know it's no secret that there was a correction on that and Al Malmoon's name was put in there, uh, but the year was kept the same. Okay, so that's, but where do we find the inscription? That's the big question. So taking this from AJ Juice, he says the dedicatory inscription in Kufic script placed around the dome contains the date believed to be the year the dome was first completed, AH 72. While the name of the corresponding caliph and builder of the dome, Al-Malik, was deleted 
and replaced by the name of Abbasid Caliph al Mamun, 813 to 833, during whose reign renovations took place. Now, this is taken from Wikipedia here. Um, you can imagine how difficult it is to find a lot of this information, but what's not helpful is the fact that it just simply says placed around the dome. So, where does that mean exactly? Does it mean on the inside of the dome itself? Does it mean on the drum, which is as indicated in the central picture? Or is it on the inner or outer side of the arcade as depicted in the picture on the right? Do you know the answer to that question? Well, the answer is given to us here from Oleg Graber, who wrote in the formation of Isla Islamic art, the Dome of the Rock is unusually rich in inscriptions, of which three are you made. The major one, 240 metres in length, is found above the arches of the inner octagonal arcade on both sides, with the exception of one place where the later Caliph al Mamun substituted his name for that of Abdul al Malik. This inscription is throughout contemporary with the building. The other two inscriptions are on copper plates on the eastern and northern gates. They too have been tampered with by the Abbasid prince, but it has been shown that they should be considered as you made. Now, so have you worked out where they are? Well, those references to Abdul al-Malik, or at least that were corrected and changed to al-Mamun, are in the inner and outer part of the arcade. Okay, so it's that one there. So that's where they're found. Okay. Um, now, we think about the importance of that. It's uh, you have the outer wall of the dome, and then you have the inner arcade, which is supporting part of the roof. And then further in, we have what's called the drum, and that's supporting the dome above it. Now, if you look at the picture in the middle, you can see very clearly that this drum is round in shape unlike the outer parts which are octagonal so this is going to be significant later just bear that in mind because what we'll see is the drum wasn't always round in fact for most of its history it was actually octagonal same as with the arcade and the outer part of the dome of the rock okay now here's something odd this is taken from uh Crystal Kessler's paper, which was originally published in 1970, but more recently republished in the Cambridge University Press. It's titled Abdul Al Malik's Inscription in the Dome of the Rock. And she says, the question must be taken up why the diacritical marks were applied almost exclusively to the inner face of the arcade only. Now, I wasn't aware of that until um, I looked at this paper. Um, why would inscriptions that were supposedly made at the same time have such a discrepancy that the inscription on the inner part of the arcade has got a different quantity of diacritical marks in comparison to the outside? So what she's saying there is that the diacritical marks were applied almost exclusively to the inner face of the arcade and not to the outer face. So that's very odd. Surely it should be the same, whether on the inside or the outside, because presumably it was made at the same time. Um, even if there was a few years of a gap, you'd imagine that they would have corrected it and made sure that they were consistent. But there's a, a mismatch there. Now, going further, she says, in connection with a reconsideration of the reasons for the building of the Dome of the Rock, uh, or W. Hamilton has drawn attention to the fact that there is an obvious difference in the character of the text on the two sides of the arcade. In fact, there is a difference both of form and of content. On the exterior are five groups of short Quranic phrases, each declaring God's unity and Muhammad's mission as his messenger. Each group is introduced by a bismillah and closed by an ornamental mark, a rosette or star in a square. In addition, there is the historical passage without a bismillah, but likewise closed by an ornament. So that's the exterior one. On the interior one, that's the one facing inwards towards the rock. However, is the text without much, without such separation marks, is more continuous and selected with a more particular intention. Here, the proclamation of God's unity and Muhammad's mission 
is followed by Quranic verses which address the people of the book, admonish them to make no mistake in their religion, denounce the idea of the Trinity, always understood as a kind of deviation from monotheism, and expound the proper view of Jesus as Spirit of God, his word conveyed into Mary, and as nothing else than a true servant of God and his messenger. Therefore, what distinguishes the text on the interior from the text on the exterior is evidently the particular polemical um, intention. Okay. For the standard Islamic narrative, she concludes that the diacritical signs were set under Abdul al-Malik, i.e. at the same time as the inscription, which is dated 72 or, or 691 AD. So is that the end of the story? Well, not quite. She says in the appendix that according to the above conclusions, the inscription of Abdul al-Malik is one of the very few early examples of diacritical marking which are properly dated. To the best of my knowledge, there are only three examples of Kufic with marks of an earlier date, two papyri and one graffito. Therefore, there is clearly a lot of stake if the inscription turns out not to be from the time of Abdul al-Malik. So the question now is how does she explain the discrepancy of uh, the diacritical marks on the outside and inside? She says, no other specimen of epigraphy dated or undated is known to have marks besides the mosaic inscription and the milestone of Abdul al-Malik. If one considers this, it seems strange that the first dated epigraphic specimen has not only a large amount of marks, but has also the widest range of marked letters among the known dated specimens of the first century. This, I believe, can only be because the text composed as, as it is of Quranic phrases and paraphrases, is closely related throughout to the Quran manuscripts and reflects the diacritical marking of the early Musafs. Except here's the problem. If we go back to what she said about the difference between the inner and outer um, arcade, let's go back. She says that on the exterior are five groups of short Quranic phrases so surely, if she's been consistent, then those should have diacritical marks if they are coming from the Quranic manuscripts. So what I've pointed out here is, this is odd, as she noted earlier, the inscriptions that lack the diacritical marks are precisely the exterior ones that quote short Quranic passages. So I don't think she, she was being consistent there, and I think it's contradictory, and perhaps she um, didn't quite think that one through. Now, it is exceedingly odd that the inscription is the only verifiable and assumed first century example uh, in this particular uh, case that we're talking about here in relation to the, the calf. To this issue, the inscription in the Dome of the Rock makes a valuable contribution. It has the calf clearly marked by one stroke below five times. When, look, when one looks for other specimens with this type of marking, one finds that the discussion is mainly based on 3rd century documents. A Mus'haf fragment, which was later in the possession of a Saljuk Sultan of Rum, a Codex of Rare Words and Tradition, fragment of a translation of the Book of Job, and an Arabic New Testament lectory and two papyri. So, you notice how that this particular um, characteristic of the calf, which is one of the Arabic letters, we can only find one example of, of it supposedly from the first century, whereas any other examples don't follow this pattern. So again, that's something else that should raise a little bit of a red flag. Is there something amiss here? Okay, so we have inscriptions where the content and form is different from the outside and inside of the arcade. Okay, we also find that um, on one side, uh, the interior arcade, we find that there's more diacritical marks. In fact, it's almost exclusively diacritical marks, whereas on the other side there isn't. And we also have this strange anomaly that it's the only example from the first century that we can verify uh, with the particular uh, uh, stroke that's used for the calf, which is one stroke below. Um, so this is kind of strange. So how do we, how do we account for this?
Um, now, um, I would suggest that the way we might account for, for this is that um, perhaps these inscriptions are not from the first century. That's one explanation and that uh, these inscriptions come from much later and that would account for the fact that they follow uh, a different method of doing things in terms of the way that they do the lettering, the way they do the diacritical marks and so on. That's one possibility. But let's go a bit further now. Let's look at um, what A.J. Juice has got to say. So he says the current inscriptions bear a construction date, 72 A.H., and the dedication of Caliph al-Mamun, who reigned from 813 to 833. It is part of a 20 meter long text that was mounted above the arches of the interior octagonal arcade. However, the Caliph's name constitutes a repair. It is said that the dome of the rock was expanded under his patronage. Did al-Mamun tear a pre-existing building down to make room for a new one? How did he enlarge an octagonal building? It's not immediately obvious how you enlarge one when you're dependent on an arcade with inscriptions on it. Do you pull them apart? How do you do that? It uh, seems a bit strange. Okay. If the Sanus drawings were its template, then it would not have been as hard as it may seem. Now, if, if you go back to part one, you'll see what is referred to. There's an image of a high tower, um, and so perhaps the enlargement was vertically rather than uh, horizontally. So that might explain it. Now, 831 AD, uh, during the reign of Caliph al Mamun, he says that bronze plates that are attached to the lintels above the four outside doors are engraved with the year 831 AD, or 206, 216 AH. According to these, should they be authentic, renovations were indeed underway. We need to keep in mind that engraving was an art that was still mastered over a thousand years later. Now, he's kind of warning us to be cautious there because we could just see that and say, well, there's the proof, there's the evidence, but it is relatively easy for someone to fake uh, inscriptions and just to backdate them. So in order to be confident that these really existed at a particular time, we'd be looking for corroborating evidence such as a witness account of having seen them and so forth. Now, more anomalies. A Saracen synagogue. Now, what's interesting about this, particularly in light of the standard Islamic narrative, it's not what you would expect in the latter half of the 9th century. Okay? The traveller Bernard the monk visited the holy city around 870 AD. Now, we think about that period. Um, already Ibn Hisham has created the Sira. So we've already have Ibn Ishaq, we've had Ibn Hisham. So the Sira is in place. Um, so it's very late. The standard Islamic narrative is pretty much there. Um, but what's happening on the Temple Mount? Let's continue. So Bernard the monk visited the holy city around 870 AD and wrote that the Temple of Solomon is in the north, which houses a Saracen synagogue. It is remarkable that Bernard recognised the building as a synagogue. Christian monks do not usually get confused about such fundamental terminology. Moreover, he places the synagogue to the north of the platform, while the Dome of the Rock sits dead centre on the north-south axis and offset to the west. To place the rock to the north, his description requires that the entire northern half of the platform would have to be built after his visit. You see from the map there that um, this is where he places this building, which he calls the Temple of Solomon, way up in the north. He doesn't mention anything about a dome of the rock, and this is in the year 870. So you're talking almost 200 years after Abd al-Malik is supposedly having built the Dome of the Rock, but there's no reference to it. That's very odd. So AJ Juice says, I'm surprised about the openness of the secret, not about the fact that it was a synagogue. Academics should perhaps take his report more seriously. It's primary evidence for a Temple of Solomon for Saracen Jews on the Temple Mount. 
It was perhaps the only building up there. Together with the Zutkin Chronicle, it appears that the Temple of Solomon was indeed a synagogue in the north of the Temple Mount, and that the foundation stone may not have been covered with a major monument, at least not just yet. Okay, so there's a lot here going on here. So what we're saying is kind of a report that suggests that the rock was not covered with a dome and that it wasn't even of a Islamic character. It was a, it's Arab, but Jewish. In some way, it's Jewish. Um, so that's, it's a strange hybrid there. Um, so bear that in mind. Let's move on. Why does no one report seeing a dome of the rock on the Temple Mount? He says, before Al Mamun, the dome of the rock appears to be invisible. After an alleged enlargement, there was a synagogue. Although absence of evidence is no evidence of absence, here we're not dealing with some obscure detail of fact, but one of the most important buildings for all Judaic religions and inscriptions for Islam. No Jew took notes, no Christian, no Muslim, no body, no soul. It's more than just an absence of evidence. It's evidence of absence is what he's saying here. In the late 9th century, the Sunni historian and geographer Yakubi reported in a way that is suggestive of the building having stood long enough to leave room for an inter interpretation. Now you can have a read of that yourself, but the key thing in it is that he says then Abdul al Malik built above the Sakra a dome. But notice how late this is 897. So in 870, the monk who visited the Temple Mount doesn't note any such building built by Abdul al Malik and particularly in the right location, in other words, above the Sakra. But here, um, almost 30 years later, uh, we have a report from Yakubi saying that Abdul al Malik had built the, the Dome of the Rock above the Sakra. So that would suggest really that something is going on here. It doesn't add up, does it? A very late contemporary evidence that a building now covers the rock. The inadmissible traditions of both historians, Yakubi and Bukhari, contain passages that claim that Mecca was forbidden or later destroyed, providing a reverse reasoning for the dome's construction. The Sufyanid rulers had long before circumambulated their building. It seems possible that the structure was not standing in the 770s or lay in ruins and that mosaics were absent towards the end of the 9th century. Yet it is the first contemporary primary evidence that a building now covers the rock and that the efforts in forming communal memory was focused on attributing a structure to Al-Malik that could only have stood for a few decades at the most. So the thing is, once you commit uh, an account to, to writing, it very quickly enters the communal memory and becomes part of tradition. And this is what he's arguing, that how, how it happened. Okay. He says, under him, Jerusalem is renamed from the Roman you made Gilia Philistine to Al-Quds Holiness thus raising the status of the holy city after tradition moved the raised Safa and Marwa to be part of adulterous hills down south. Now if you're not clear about what the reference to Safa and Marwa there is, go back and look at part one, which will have a link up above, um, and you can see what that's about. In short, the first prototype for the Dome of the Rock was built between 870 and 897 AD precisely when tradition starts to creating a new communal memory. Therefore, neither Abdul al-Malik's dedicatory inscription nor al-Mamun's correction could have existed before that time. So we could easily just stop it there. He's essentially given us really solid evidence that that inscription is a forgery. It's not from the time it comes from because you first of all need the building to be there in order for the inscription to exist. Okay, so that's a major problem. Now, 
We have a first description of the Dome of the Rock that resembles the building as it stands today at the middle of the Haram area. It does not tell us that it is octagonal, however. So, in the year 903 AD, Ibn al Faqi al Hamadani provides for the first eyewitness account that there was a platform leading up to the Dome of the Rock. I'm not going to read through it all, but the, the key thing is that it does not tell us that it is octagonal. There is a rec recognition that there is a Dome of the Rock there. It gives us certain dimensions, but there's no um, declaration that it was octagonal. Okay. The inscriptions and mosaics are still missing, but he mentions Al-Malik. The semblance is toppled, though, in a detailed description by the Spanish Arab Ibn Abdul Rabi. He mentions 30 columns and 80, 18 around the rock, and this disagrees with al Key and the extant building. So there's something going on here. There's cross wires and the accuracy of, of these witnesses is in question. Now here, uh, this is in relation to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. We can see that it is in a different location to, to where it is today. Another description from 978 AD by Ibn Hakal and Istak Bri provides more details about the Dome of the Rock. We just focus on what's inside the red box. Uh, there is here a mosque uh, greater than which does not exist in all Islam. The main building, supposedly the Aqsa Mosque, occupies the southeastern angle of the mosque, i.e. the noble sanctuary, and covers about half the breadth of the same. So we've got two things to bear in mind. Instead of it being directly south of the, the, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa is in the southeastern part and it's huge. It basically covers half the width of the Temple Mount. Okay, so much larger than what we have heard of before. But still, there is neither information about mosaics nor the unusual octagonal shape of the building. There is also no attribution to Abdul al-Malik and the notion of earlier builders would persist. So this is not in relation to obviously the Al-Aqsa, but in relation to the Dome of the Rock. The Sufyanid um, and Marwanid buildings near the eastern and northern walls have by now disappeared. Again, I would ask you to look at part one to see the significance of those. The late 10th century. Uh, the first report outside of earlier tradition that claims Al-Malik's involvement emerges with the late 10th century geographer Al-Muqaddazi. The Al-Aqsa Mosque lies at the southeastern corner of the Holy City. The stones of its foundations of the outer wall, which were laid by David, are 10 L's or little less in length. On these, the Caliph Abdul al-Malik subsequently built using smaller but well-shaped stones and battlements are added above. This mosque is even more beautiful than that of Damascus, for during the building of it, they had for arrival and as a comparison, the great church belonging to the Christians at Jerusalem, and they built this to be even more magnificent than the other. But in the days of the Abbasis occurred the earthquakes, which threw down most of the main building, all in fact except the portion around the Mihrab. The edifice rose firmer and more substantial than ever it had been in former times, more ancient portion remained even like a beauty spot in the midst of the new. Now the problem with this is that if it's saying, and if we can trust this t 10th century um, account, that most of the Dome of the Rock had been thrown down during an earthquake um, and only uh, a key portion of it remained, so that would have easily destroyed the, the mosaics and inscriptions had they existed inside the Dome of the Rock. al Muqaddazi's description of the Al-Aqsa Mosque details mosaic stores and other ornaments. In describing the Mosque of Damascus, he compares Al-Aqsa with the Great Church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which he calls the Kumama, the Dunghill, intended to smear Islam's competition. In the context of Damascus, he notes about the Kumama, Caliph Abdul al-Malik, noting the greatness of the dome of the Qumama and its magnificence, was moved lest it should dazzle the minds of the Muslims, 
and hence erected above the rock the dome which now is seen there. Unfortunately, as we've just seen, um, Bernard the monk doesn't seem to have noticed this when he went to the Temple Mount in 870. There is no doubt that al Muqaddazi saw the Dome of the Rock. In the centre of the platform is the Dome of the Rock, which rises above an octagonal building having four gates, one opposite to each of the flights of steps leading up from the court. All these are adorned with gold and closing each of them is a beautiful door of cedar wood finely worked in pattern. These last were sent by command of the mother of the Caliph al Muqtadir Billah, uh, 908-932. At each of the gates is a balustrade of marble and cedar wood with brass work without and in the railing likewise are gates but these are unornamented. Finally, the Dome of the Rock is undoubtedly an octagonal building. Why then would he compare it with the Holy Sepulchre, if not because of preconceived information about a no longer existing building that he already had? Renovations at the Dome seem to have been underfoot at the beginning of the 10th century. Now, so I'm not sure about that last bit, but I think the key thing to draw from it is certainly that we have our first reference to the building being octagonal and this is late 10th century. In 1019 to 1020 AD, Al-Wasiti, the preacher of the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, produces a detailed account of Al-Malik's involvement, which I'll read in full here. When Abdul Al-Malik wanted to build the Dome of the Rock, he came from Damascus to Jerusalem. He then sent to all his deputies in all his dominions he wrote, Abdul al-Malik plans to build a dome over the rock to shelter the Muslims from cold and heat and to construct the masjid. But before he starts, he wants to know his subject's opinion. With their approval, the deputies wrote back, May God permit the completion of this enterprise and may he count the building of the dome and the masjid a good deed for Abdul al-Malik and his predecessors. He then gathered craftsmen from all his dominions and asked them to provide him with the description and form of the planned dome before he engaged in its construction. So it was marked for him in the San of the Masjid. He then ordered the building of the treasury to the east of the rock, which is on the edge of the rock, and filled it with money. He then appointed Raja ibn Jewa and Yasid ibn Salam as supervisors and ordered them to spend generously on its construction. He then returned to Damascus. When the two men satisfactorily completed the building, they wrote to Abdul al-Malik to inform him that they had completed the construction of his dome and the Aqsa Mosque. They ended their letter with the expression, there is nothing in the building that leaves room for criticism. In other words, it's perfect. They informed him that the sum of 100,000 dinars was left from the money he allocated. He offered it to them as a reward, but they declined, indicating that they had already been generously compensated. Abdul al-Malik then ordered that the gold coins be melted and cast on the exterior of the dome, which then so glitters that no one could look straight into it. Now, we're expected to believe that Abdul al-Malik was rolling in money at that time. This is straight after the second fitna, the second civil war, which more than likely would have drained his co coffers. Um, do you believe that? I find that very hard to believe. So AJ Jew says, centuries after the fact we are handed names of architects, receiving the approval of Al Malik's subjects, a perfect building was erected that no Muslim could have explained, one so beautiful that it could not be improved upon. The dome that was previously covered in red gold is now cast in Al Malik's gold coins. There is no need to pretend that this is anything other than a fairy tale. Suddenly evidence surfaces that is so spurious and self-congratulatory that it leaves no doubt that it either never existed or was backdated. His account bears no credibility whatsoever. The oral chain of transmission that spans over 300 years is just as spurious as the text itself. Attempts to rationalise that al Wasiti's account is corroborated by the inscriptions is ludicrous. His text reveals that there was no dedicatory inscription at this time, manipulated by al Mamun or not. He would otherwise undoubtedly have noticed its falsehood. He also does not talk about other features. 
in particular the function of the stone that is covered by the building or the circumambulation around it. He does not mention them because these functions were moved to Mecca and are no longer visible in Al Wasiti's Jerusalem. So do you see the point about um, Al Mamun? If the inscription was there with the correction with Al Mamun's name in it and he's claiming that um, Abdul Al Malik built the Dome of the Rock, surely he would have pointed out that there's a mistake there in the description, but he doesn't. So that again hints at, if not proves, that this inscription didn't exist yet. No evidence of absence needs to be presented for mosaics and inscriptions in a building that does not exist. And I think that's fair enough. If there's no building there, how can we say that there are inscriptions or mosaics? We first of all need the building to exist at the time. Late 10th century, al muqaddazi shows an interest in mosaics when reporting on the Umayyad Mosque of Damascus. Mosaic is composed of morsels of glass such as are used for the standard coin weights, but they are yellow in colour or grey, black, red and mottled or else gilt by laying gold on the surface, which is then covered by a thin sheet of glass. They prepare plaster with Arabian gum and lay it over the walls, and this they ornament with the mosaics, which are set so as to form figures and inscriptions. In some cases they cover the whole surface with the gold mosaic, so that all the wall seems as though it were built of nothing but pure gold. So clearly you can see that this guy was interested in mosaics. So if there is someone that could report on the inscriptions and the mosaics in the Dome of the Rock, he's your guy. So given his interest, what accounts for his failure to report on the inscriptions other than their absence? A.J. Juice says his interest in the details tells us that it is not likely that al Muqaddasi would miss mentioning mosaics and inscriptions, in particular if they are of outstanding workmanship like the ones inside the Dome of the Rock. So this is what he says. He says the dome externally is completely covered with brass plates, gilt, while the building itself, its floor and its walls and the drum, both within and without, are ornamented with marble and mosaics after the manner that we have already described when speaking of the Mosque of Damascus. The cupola of the dome is built in three sections. The inner is of ornamented plates, next comes iron beams interlaced, set in frieze so that the wind may not cause it to shift, and the third casing is of wood on which are fixed the outer plates. Up to the middle of the cupola goes a passageway by which a workman may ascend to the pinnacle for aught they may be wanting, or in order to repair the structure. At the dawn, when the light of the sun first strikes on the cupola and the drum reflects his rays, then is his edifice a marvellous sight to behold, and one such that in all Islam I have never seen equal, neither have I heard tell of aught built in pagan times that would rival in grace the dome of the rock. So do you see any mention about the inscriptions? There is none. So given the chance al muqaddazi would not fail to mock Christians and the inscriptions were a golden opportunity to do just that, but instead nothing. A.G.G. says that the workmen did not seem to have taken note of inscriptions, neither did al muqaddazi who otherwise described Jerusalem as a city dominated by Christians and Jews. He never failed to mock Christians. In one passage in the text he marvels at a talisman that is inscribed with Muhammad is Allah's apostle and again in the name of Allah the merciful, the compassionate, but not the inscriptions. That's an anomaly which really can only be explained by the fact that these inscriptions didn't yet exist in the building. At this time the dispute over the origin of the building was by no means settled. The Fatimid geographer al muhallabi 990 AD, asserted that Al-Walid I had built the Dome of the Rock as a monument for the Last Judgment. If there would have been a dedication, his error would have been apparent. Before him, Eutysius did likewise, adding that the Dome was moved to the Temple Mount from a church in Baalbek. So, it's pretty obvious. He's reporting that Al-Walid built the Dome of the Rock, but if there was such a, an inscription inside it, 
all he had to do was just to read that and see that it wasn't al walid so clearly there's no inscription there's no guide to who built it again al wasiti uh, 1019 20 AD, misses an opportunity to refer to the supposed inscriptions hanging in the dome of the rock he says during the time of abdul al malik there was hanging on the chain above the rock under the dome the yatama pearl the horns of abraham's ram and the crown of husro when the binu hashim the abbasids took over the caliphate they sent them to the kaaba do you see any reference to the inscriptions and that's in 1020 a.d so this is centuries afterwards and still no reference to the inscriptions of course he misses the mosaics and inscriptions for a simple reason they were absent that's the most simple um, explanation for the, the failure repeatedly across many witnesses to mention these inscriptions which should have been the highlight of what was going on inside the Dome of the Rock. al Mukaddazi reports about designs and inscriptions in Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Describing the Dome of the Rock in detail he sees interior mosaics but does not mention Islam's most important inscriptions with verses of the Quran and a mention of Prophet Muhammad. Instead he seems to view the mosaics as similar to those in the Umayyad Mosque of Damascus. In plain English that means a multitude of species of trees and recognisable towns, a depiction of the ruler's realm. And obviously those do not exist in the Dome of the Rock today. Jerusalem was henceforth occupied by Christian rulers for almost two centuries. Given the insults that are hurled towards the Crusaders' beliefs in the nature of Jesus, who is both God and man, the inscriptions would not likely have survived this period. The presence of Mamluk rosettes and other period designs on the painted ceiling does not instil confidence in a case for an early creation. So if you think about that for a second, how would the inscriptions have survived two centuries of the Crusaders occupying the Temple Mount? Surely they would have worked out what they say and got rid of them because when the Crusaders were there they, they set up chapels, they had an altar, they had statues, they had all the regalia to do with Christian prayer and liturgies and masses and so on. So surely if those inscriptions were there they would have taken them down but that would be if they were there. So in relation to the Mamluks, we saw a reference there to the, the Mamluk rosettes. The presence of Mamluk rosettes and other period designs on the painted ceiling does not instill confidence in a case for an early creation. So when were the Mamluks? They were from 1250 to 1517. Okay, so it's quite late. The Mamluk rosettes on the ceiling cannot be before the mid 13th century as a result. So that's kind of important to point out that. So you can see here under the descriptions are motifs supposedly created at a time that Islam was still in formation. AJ Juice says we might expect that their symbolism was not fully evolved. Let's look at the motif that's in the red rectangle at the base. So AJ Juice says that this symbolism is Jewish the wheel of the vase stand represents the ten tribes of Judaism with the throne of David in its centre. And let's look at the top part. Now, it should point out that A.J. Juice refers to this as having demonic symbolism. Uh, in particular, if we look at this section here, it's that of the head of a snake. Okay, it's not pretty, ob it's not very obvious. But that's what he, he, he and that's at the very center of it so that's kind of a, a strange image to have so he says it takes somebody without preconception to find the apparent demonic symbolism he says on top of the ten tribes is the wheel of the sadducee supreme leader the six pearls that are placed around the leaders signify the divine council with six members each and also the star of david the priestly breastplate again represents the ten tribes with the roots of the house of King David shooting out at its centre. Two stones of the tribes are covered by the roots. The towering head of a king is the Sadducee, supreme leader, 
represented as the all-consuming serpent, the deceiver. He goes on to argue here that Messianic Judaism is at the foundation of Islam. The foundation of Islam is Messianic Judaism represented by the lineages of the houses of Joseph and Ali. The Quran itself orientations of mosques or rather synagogues, old Talmuds and the Doctrina Jacobi speak of the same Messianic mechanism that is followed by the Jewish founding fathers of Islam, although they fall into enduring dispute over its leadership. The arrangement embodies a dual government with the Sadducee supreme leader from the house of Joseph and the throne of David at his side and the ten tribes of Israel. This form of government is described by Benjamin of Tudela in Baghdad of the Abbasid era. In the early Umayyad period, the throne of Muhammad was specifically rejected, although his throne represents the Sadducee spiritual leadership by the house of Joseph. Now he says that the symbolism indicates that it came from a later time to that of Abdul al-Malik. Whoever designed these mosaics must have agreed with the supreme Sadducee leadership that rules with a subservient throne of David. Abdul al-Malik had to submit to the House of Ali, which is upside down. The status of Muhammad ibn al-Hanifa opposes the imagery inside the Dome of the Rock. Neither Muhammad nor Abdul al-Malik would have agreed to it. So here we're not talking about the Muhammad of traditions, but the contemporary Muhammad ibn al Hanafa. Now, he goes on to say that the mosaics themselves are artistically anachronistic. So apart from the fact that the symbolism is very Jewish, the, the style of them is anachronistic, ahistorical. They come from a different time. Likewise, the mosaics covering the inside seem artistically ahead of their time compared to the frescoes in Khazar Amra, a uh, Umayyad palace from 30 years later. The frescoes still depict humans and animals. This is an inexplicable reversal of the guidelines for iconography that was supposedly ordered by Abdul al-Malik. In contrast to the construction of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, of which no evidence exists, the Umayyad Mosque is well documented despite its lack of major religious significance and that contrast is very peculiar when we think about it. Going by primary evidence, the picture is much clearer with lots to wish for and less convoluted than the glorious emergence of a new religion from a nest with a Kaaba that did not exist. Instead, Jewish professionals were involved at every corner of its evolution as ringleaders. Um, in Judaism of the 7th century, it was the conflict between the adherents of Babylonian Talmud against those of the Jerusalem Talmud, the House of Valley against the House of Joseph. This division is specifically addressed in Surah 83, where the Sijin is the register of the wicked, while the register of the righteous is Ilion, Babylon and Jerusalem. Those willing to invest in learning can pull the story straight from the differences between the two Talmuds. Um, another part of his argument about the fact that the artwork in the Dome of the Rock is anachronistic is he compares it to some of the other artwork of the time, particularly the Christian artwork. So he says the quality of Christian mosaics of the period are as far apart from those in the Dome of the Rock as early matrix printers from modern laser machines. The 6th century mosaic map from Madaba is crude, as you can see on the right. It was created around 570 AD. The artists appear to have had difficulties with simple scripts and curves. It is more akin to a crude sketch absent of any details, care or thought. Cheap, worthless and sloppy, he says. Okay, as you can see, it is very basic. Um, he goes on to say, in contrast, the mosaics and inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock are smooth and elegant, full of details that are thoughtful and lavishly executed. The frescoes in Khazar Amra are likewise generations behind the artistic level in the Dome of the Rock. He goes on to say, the level of artistry and thought in the Umayyad Mosque seems closer to the Madaba map than to the mosaics in the Dome of the Rock, even though the mosaics were supposedly created 25 years later. Certainly, they were able to create curves and recognisable detail 
but compared to earlier mosaic works from the Roman period, they are all rather primitive. Another observation he makes is the, the nature of the Arabic itself. Modern expert in medieval Islamic art and archaeology, Marcus Milwright, made a stunning observation in his book about the Dome of the Rock. They were in all likelihood laid by craftsmen whose principal language was not Arabic. A.J. Jews suggests two times. Two, two periods come to mind, the Crusades, well, that's kind of obvious because that's when the Christians were there from all over Europe, and the second period, he says, are the time of the Ottomans. Now, if it is the time of the Ottomans, then we're talking about these inscriptions being from no uh, earlier than 500 years ago, which would be quite a late period for these inscriptions to have come about if if this observation is correct. The art history on display in the Dome of the Rock was unlikely to come from the 7th century. The mosaics in the Dome of the Rock are centuries ahead of the style of Abdul al-Malik's time. The 7th century is also a global, cultural, artistical, intellectual, financial and political low point. Artisans of such abilities would have been few and far in between anywhere in the known world. If they were produced at that time, then there must have existed a large Syrian mosaic shop that had independently developed its own distinctive character, far ahead of all others. After the completion of these mosaics, the shop must have vanished back to whence it came without leaving another trace. So it basically stands out like a sore thumb at that period. It would suggest that there's something not quite right with the standard Islamic narrative here on this one. And, th and there's another issue which is that of the idea that it was a forgery. Why would a forgery make an obvious error such as putting al Mamun if it came from centuries later? You know, surely the forger would just simply put Abdul al Malik and not raise any eyebrows, not raise any questions. But the suggestion is that this is a kind of a clever misdirection. So let's read further. The dedication at the Dome of the Rock is taken as a fraud because the tiles did not match. He had to squeeze his dedication. Um, Abdul Allah, the Imam al Mamun, into the previous space and he omitted to also alter the year of construction, 691 AD. I wonder which forger might make this fraud so obvious. Due to sustained damage of the mosaics during many earthquakes, they must have been repaired and restored many times over the centuries. But this is the evidence that Al Mamun committed a fraud to take credit for a building that did not that he did not erect. The signature of Al Mamun is another clue that the inscription may date from much later. So much so that those who applied it carelessly were confused about who may have ruled the caliphate at the time of the dome's construction. The correction might have arisen because of such confusion. Or it could be, as I suggest at the top, a case of a double bluff to hide the fact that this was just a redaction back to the time. Now, two inscriptions attest to the dome's restoration after an earthquake in 1015-1016. The biggest threat to the notion that inscriptions and mosaics could have survived from the 7th century until today was an earthquake in 1015-1016 that caused the dome to fall onto the enshrined rock. Two inscriptions attest to the restoration of the collapsed dome in 1022-1023. The first is written on a beam of the dome in ancient karmatic characters. It stands apart with its claim to global leadership wherein their god has given its Fatimid caliph kingship over the east and the west of the earth. If there was a crime for grandeur, then this is it. The aspiration is so over the head of Abdul Hassan Ali and so imperial that it is hardly genuine. The second is merely a fragment with the date 418 or 1027 AD. It dates the lower flower mosaics. But in any case, if there was an earthquake in the 11th century and it brought down the dome, surely 
the arcades would have been badly damaged by this collapse. If you just imagine the images of the Twin Towers coming down and how the, the physical force of the downward collapse resulted in the collapse of floors underneath. So you'd imagine that with the, the weight of the dome of the rock, if it were to come down, it would have not only crashed vertically down, it would have caused outward uh, movement of material that would invariably have done at least some damage to the arcade perhaps not knocking the entire arcade but certainly have done some damage to the mosaics and yet we're expected to believe that the mosaics managed to be um, unscathed by by all of that given the sporting columns had to be replaced would the inscriptions have survived without a scar the descriptions of the time are markedly different from the modern appearance. While the main walls appear to be the same with exact measurements given, the arrangement of the inner supporting columns is so different that another destructive event must have consumed weaker parts of the structure. So he gives an example by comparing uh, the description of the supporting columns with what exists today. Um, so on the left is his imagined ground plan of the Dome of the Rock from the time with eight inner supporting columns and 24 outer columns. On the other side we have 12 inner supporting columns and 16 outer columns. Surely if they had replaced so many columns that would have meant that everything that those supported would have been damaged or brought down or had collapsed and so therefore wouldn't have existed. Um, it certainly would suggest that, wouldn't it? Mosaics surviving with no visible repairs is inconceivable. Given that the dome is carried by the inner columns, it is unimaginable that mosaics would have survived such a structural undertaking without major repairs being necessary and visible in the mosaics. Likewise, mosaics and dedicatory inscriptions on the inner octagonal arcade could not have survived such structural changes. So put simply, if you start pulling out columns from under um, a wall, and those are supporting the weight of the wall, at the very least, it should cause cracks. Even if you go and try and support them, it's, it's very difficult to just pull out um, column and then expect that there be no damage. Um, so I think that's a good point. Indeed, just a few years later, in 1033 AD, multiple earthquakes hit the area and caused mass casualties. The outer wall of the Haram area was thrown down. And if you think of the outer wall of the Haram area, those are the those massive big blocks of stone. Okay, so those were knocked down by the earthquake. How did these um, spindles of columns that were supporting the Dome of Rock managed to survive and, and also the mosaics above them survive if these massive rocks were thrown down by the earthquake. It's, it's hard to imagine that.